Is repentance a work? This is a controversial question because you will hear a variety of answers on this topic. Now, part of the problem is that the question itself is fundamentally flawed because different people are going to define repentance in different ways, depending on who you ask. And they have different definitions of repentance, but it's all conflated into this same thing called repentance. So two different people will give you two different answers because they're defining repentance slightly differently, but they argue as if they're talking about the same thing when they're not. Now, the reason why this question matters, because if we just assume for the sake of argument that repentance is a work, it involves work, and we say that you have to repent to be saved, well, that's work salvation, essentially. You have to do works to be saved. Now, I already alluded to this in the third video in the series when I answered the question, do we have to repent to be saved? And I explained in that video that it really depends on how you're defining repentance. So if you define repentance as turning from sin, well, then that's work salvation. So I would say no. But then people will misappropriate me saying that and say that I'm proclaiming that you don't have to repent to be saved which is false. We do have to repent to be saved, but I'm arguing from a different definition of repentance than they are, that you have to repent of your unbelief or repent of, say, trusting in your own obedience or trusting in another God. The verb to repent can act as both a transitive and an intransitive verb. For this reason, there are actually two questions to be answered in this video, which are often confused as if they are the same question. So the question from the point of view of the intransitive is, is repentance a work? But from the transitive point of view, it's, is repentance of sins a work? You see, the transitive of sins is often conflated with the intransitive, but these are not the same thing. When the Bible uses the intransitive verb, the surrounding context is needed to define repentance. You cannot just tack the words of sins in the verse itself. So to illustrate this, I'm going to give you two carnal scenarios when it comes to repentance, that it may be a work or it may not be a work, depending on how you're defining. In the first scenario, Brother in Christ number one tells me privately that he really, really hates Brother in Christ number two. Brother one hasn't done anything to Brother two. He hasn't expressed any hatred directly towards Brother two, who doesn't even realise that Brother one hates him. So Brother one only hates Brother two in thought, but not in word or deed, and he's only telling me privately. I then explain to him the commandments from Jesus to love one another and to forgive one another, and insist that he has a more graceful attitude towards Brother two. Brother 2 has no idea that Brother 1 hates him or that we have had this conversation. In this scenario, I haven't actually asked Brother 1 to do anything differently. Since he has not directly expressed hatred towards Brother 2 or done any evil deed towards him, there is no action to repent of. He just needs to change his attitude or mind about Brother 2. And in such scenario, repentance is a change of mind, but not action. So you might argue strictly that repentance is not a work, at least in the strictest sense of the word. Now, you could argue that it works in the sense that it's his obedience to various commands, but there's no outward evidence of this repentance. It's just a positional change of mind. In the second scenario, brother number one constantly shows utter contempt towards brother two. Even if brother two hasn't done anything wrong or isn't retaliating, he keeps causing problems for brother two and making his life difficult. I then rebuke brother one, demand that he forgives brother two, treats him as a brother in Christ and actually makes an effort to undo some of the damage that he has done to brother two. In this scenario, repentance is a work. I am asking brother number one not only to have a loving mind towards brother two, but to actually make amendments and do works of love towards brother two. So in the first scenario, repentance was not a work, or at least arguably. In scenario number two, repentance was a work. Christians argue with and contradict each other whether repentance is or not a work but they are arguing from multiple scenarios or circumstances and confusing them all with this singular thing called repentance. The confusion is that most Christians automatically assume that repentance means to turn from sin. And although they agree on this definition, they cannot quite agree on what turning from sin means. Some say you just have to have an attitude change towards sin, while others say to actually turn from sin and stop doing it. Others say it means a changed lifestyle. Some say that this must involve doing good works also. Now at this stage, I've done more than enough videos to show that repentance doesn't automatically mean turn from sin. And we've covered several things, such as the unrepentant cities, sinners to repentance. Obviously, I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said. But referring back to the aforementioned video three, do we have to repent to be saved? I explained that this depends on your definition. So if you say that you have to repent by changing your mind about the gospel, such as turning away from a false god, or turning towards the true god, or turning from unbelief towards belief, 
then yes, you have to repent. But I said that if you have to repent of your sins, then no, because that's work salvation. So even though I've alluded to it before, that's going to be the focus of this video. Is repentance, and specifically repenting of sins, a work? I will explain this with scriptural support. In summary, I am saying that if repentance means change what you believe, then no, repentance is not a work, rather it is faith. If repentance means change what actions you do, i.e. turn from sin, then yes, repentance is a work. But these are not the same thing. Hence you see the confusion when asking, is repentance works or faith? Now those of you that are already saved and know the Bible fairly well, will be very familiar with the fact that many of these lordshippers and sinless perfectionists, and basically anybody who sneaks in works, they all talk like a politician, right? With double, double talking, this, this pivoting, right? So rage is comfort in his ilk. They'll say that we're saved by grace, not of works. Uh, so repenting of sin is not works. But then these same people say, well, faith is works because it's something you do. So they constantly use these tricks all the time to confuse you into thinking that they're right. In the same video that I showed you in the overlay, Ray Comfort also quoted John the Baptist as saying, bring forth works meet for repentance. But that's not what John the Baptist actually said. He's confusing what John the Baptist said with what Paul said when Paul said, do works meet for repentance. But John the Baptist said, bring forth fruits, not bring forth works or do works. And he's not the only person with this double talk, of course. Many lordshippers do this. But even on the more extreme end of the spectrum, such as the sinless perfectionists, they even can't get their own story straight on whether it is a work or it isn't a work. So let's take a look at a few examples that I've handpicked of people saying whether repentance is of sins is a work or isn't a work. And then we'll just look what the Bible says. Todd Friel from Wretched says that repentance is not a work because you are not doing a thing. By turning from sin or refraining from sinning, henceforth, you are ceasing to do something. So it is not a work. And this is in his video, Is Repentance a Work? For example, if he doesn't punch you in the face, this is not a work. Rather, he is just not doing something. So repentance just means to stop sinning. It doesn't mean to do works for rewards. Therefore, it's not work salvation. In conclusion, because repenting of your sins is not works, you don't get rewarded for not sinning. Not sinning is just how you're expected to live. You don't get praise for not being evil. It's just your basic responsibility. Now, I don't know why he would mention doing something for rewards when salvation is a gift. That's a non sequitur, but never mind that. Now, Adam from Abide in the Word, who many of you will know is a reprobate I've exposed on my channel before, he says that repentance is absolutely a turning from sin. And one of the verses he uses to justify this is Acts 26.20, where it talks about doing deeds for repentance. So in this way, he is defining repenting of sins as works, because he's quoting a verse that says you have to do works and equates that with turning from sin. Now, Hal Chafee says that repentance is not a work. It is an intention to do that work. And so if we don't do that work, it shows that the repentance was not genuine. And this was in his video, What Does It Mean to Repent? But frankly, he's on good terms with abiding the word anyway, and they consider themselves to be brothers in Christ. So one says it is a work. Another says it's just an intention to work. But we have to see that work anyway. So I'm just going to assume that this is really a difference without distinction. So anyway, different people have different answers on whether repenting of sin is a work or is not a work. You know, it's sort of like pulling petals off a daisy. It is a work. It's not a work. It is a work. It's not a work. I already answered earlier in this video that repentance may or may not involve a change of action depending on the context. I am asserting that if repentance for salvation is a change of mind only, a change from unbelief to belief, then it is not a work. However, if repentance either for salvation or some other reason is a change of action, then it is a work. Now, in video number four, we looked at John the Baptist's repentance. Evidence from the account in the Synoptic Gospels would suggest that John the Baptist was not preaching to churches of believers, so he was not commanding repentance for the benefit of the saints. Rather, he was preaching repentance as a one-time message for the remission of sins, and so basically preaching the gospel. It's the initial message to transition people from being unsaved to saved. And we saw in that video that Matthew 21.32 proves without a shadow of a doubt that the message of repentance that John the Baptist preached was to believe on the Christ that he was preaching. So legalists can choke on this verse. And just in case someone wants to wriggle their way out of Matthew 21.32, Acts chapter 19 verse 4 also complements this exact same principle, that the baptism of repentance was to believe on the Christ coming after. So again, legalists can choke on this verse as well. So when it comes to repentance as part of the gospel for salvation, repentance is defined as turning in faith. Look towards the Christ, believe on him, 
trusting in him to bring about your salvation and consequently the remission of sins. Now Ray Comfort and James White and all these Calvinists of Lordshippers will play various tricks with this and they'll say things like, for example, well, believing is a verb and a verb is an action that you do, so it works. But this is really just playing word games to brainwash people. The Bible explicitly contrasts faith from works, thereby showing that faith is not work. The fact that believing is a verb or an action is is a red herring because that's just how linguistics and grammar operates. For example, in Romans 3.28, Paul explains justification unto righteousness as being by faith without the deeds of the law, deeds being a synonymous word for works. He later explains in chapter 9, describing the stumbling of Israel, that they sought it by works and not faith. Now, some people will again play these tricks and say that this just refers to works without faith, not works and faith, and we need works and faith to be saved. But the Jews believed in God. They weren't atheists. So this is once again just one of their filthy tricks. Now, there's more I could say on this, but we don't want to drift off topic. So repentance in belief or faith, that's not works. That's just a change of mind. It's not a change of action. Faith is not works because Paul explicitly contrasted faith and grace as being the opposite of works as it pertains to righteousness. But what about a change of action, otherwise known as repent of your sins? Is this works or is it faith? Now, I did briefly explain this in video 11 when we looked at the repentance of Nineveh. And in that video, I pointed out Jonah chapter 3 verse 10, where it says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And as I pointed out then, the Bible does not say God saw their faith, or God saw how they believed him, or God saw how they trusted him, or God saw the fruits of their repentance, or God saw the works that their faith produced. The Bible does say God saw their works. So if you tell someone that they have to turn from their evil ways or turn from sins and believe in Jesus, you're essentially teaching that they have to have faith and have works to be justified unto righteousness. People will then explain this away with various ways. For example, James White once tried refuting Stephen Anderson over this issue, and I'm not quoting him verbatim because it wouldn't make sense without the full context, but essentially he said that applying Jonah 3.10 in this way is acontextual. All Jonah 3.10 means is that God saw what they did, but you can't transfer that onto the word works in Paul's arguments when he says that we are justified without works. So a bit like when I tell people that you can't couple confess and forsake your sins with repent and believe the gospel, that you can't couple those two things. He's kind of saying the same thing with Jonah 3.10 and the things that Paul says about faith without works. You, you can't couple those two things just because it happen, happens to use the word works. But this is what legalists do. They're always trying to blur the separation between grace and works. Let's get some context from Jonah 3 to see how God seeing their works and doings was made manifest. Did the Ninevites turn from their evil way by just refraining from doing any further evil, as Todd Friel's interpretation of repentance suggests? Did the Ninevites pour down their alcohol and tear down their idols and punish wrongdoers? What did their turning from wickedness look like? Now, you may remember in video 11 that I kind of said that we don't know what their wickedness was. Well, we, we kind of know, actually, so a small correction on that. We do sort of know in that it's kind of violence that we get from this passage, but we don't really have a lot of detail. So the violence that was in their hands from chapter 3 verse 8 is really the closest thing that we get to any kind of description of what sort of wickedness they were actually guilty of. It's so unimportant that Jonah doesn't even give us any detail about it. So going back to chapter 3 then, in verse 4, Jonah warns that the city will be overthrown. And verse 5 starts by saying that the people believed God's message through Jonah. So they believed the message. How did they respond? What did they do? Well, the first thing they did in verse 5 was proclaim a fast. Now, except for the sin of gluttony, which is not evident that this city was full of gluttons, fasting does not just stop you from sinning. And by the way, the Bible doesn't document fasting until 2 Samuel. There is no strict commandment in the law to actually fast. There's no prescriptive instructions to fast according to Moses' law. But there was an action here. They actually did something. Something that is not easy. Something that actually takes effort to do. The second thing they did was put on sackcloth. Now again, much like fasting, there is no mosaic prescription for this practice, but it is a practice that was known in the Bible, particularly when people were mourning, and it's also tied with fasting in other parts of the Bible as well. So the very first verse that documents how their repentance of sins was made manifest isn't even evident that they actually stopped sinning. 
We don't know if they put on sackcloth and ashes because they were actually sorry for their sins and would never do them again, only that they were appealing to God to repent of destroying their city. This was not refraining from doing evil, they were actually doing something positive. And so in verse 6, then we see the king carrying out this action of putting on sackcloth, and he sat in ashes too, which again, if you're familiar with the Bible, you'll know that that often accompanied sackcloth. And then in verses 7 and 8, the king even decreed that the animals should fast, even though this has absolutely no spiritual value whatsoever. But as God would later explain to Jonah, they can't even discern their right from their left. But in any case, they actually did something. So then the last thing that's to be decreed is the discontinuing from sin. And the closest concrete example we actually have here is so vague and specific. We don't know what violence they were guilty of. They couldn't all be violent, otherwise the city would have already collapsed by now. And it only says, let every man turn from his evil way. Notice that it says way, singular. But do you think that everyone in Nineveh was only guilty of one or two sins? Of course not. So in a key passage about turning from wickedness, it doesn't even go into very much detail about how they turned from sins. And the most detail we have is about all the works that they did beside turning from sin, that they put on sackcloth and fasted. This actually involved doing good works, not just refraining from continuing in evil works. But what about the other interpretations? Is repentance from sin a work according to the New Testament paradigm as it is applied to the gospel of salvation? Given that James White says we can't apply Jonah 3 to such doctrine, and Hal Chafee in Abide in the Word openly profess work salvation, is repentance a work according to the New Testament? Well, obviously we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. You know, we can't just depend on one little passage. We ought to have more than that and get some cross-biblical support for this, particularly from the New Testament in order to answer this question. Well, there's many passages I could cover. I've just handpicked a few for the sake of this video. So let's start with Acts 26.20, because as I mentioned earlier, this is a verse that Abide in the Word used to prove that repentance does mean turn from sin. This is his proof text here, where it says, Do works meet for repentance? Well, the first thing I notice here is that sin is not actually mentioned in this verse. We don't know what works Paul was talking about here. So he can't even know when he quotes this verse that Paul was talking about sin in that verse. Ask yourself this question though, why would somebody quote passages about doing works that do not mention sin to justify the doctrine that we have to repent of our sins to be saved? The answer is simple, because they know that turning from their sins is works, so they are proclaiming a works-based salvation, and in doing so they are rejecting grace, even if they use their double-talking politician speak to say that they believe in salvation by grace. And it's not just Acts 26.20. Of course, people even quote James 2, faith without works is dead, as if that's some kind of a proof text that you have to turn from your sins. But if you look at the people that James commended for their works, Abraham and Rahab, he doesn't even mention their sins. Yes, he mentions some works that they did by mighty faith, doesn't mention their turning from sins though, but people will use that passage to justify that we have to repent of our sins when it talks about faith and works. And it's not just sinless perfectionists that do this, lordshippers who pretend to believe in grace do this as well. But you know, it comes as no surprise that James 2, faith without works is dead, or even the demons believe and tremble, would be used to promote this false repent of your sins gospel, even when James wasn't talking about sin in that excerpt. Because James himself goes on to say later in the same epistle, in 4.17 he says, Therefore to him that knows to do good, and does it not, to him it is sin. Now if that right there doesn't do it for you, I don't know what does. Turning from sin is not just refraining from evil, i.e. declining to do evil works, it must also involve doing good works, because if you know to do these good works and don't do them, then to you it is sin. So this disproves Todd Friel's proclamations that turning from sin is just refraining from evil. That's completely false. If you repent of sins, you have to do good. You don't have a choice. And what James says is perfectly consistent with what Paul says also as Paul outlined salvation in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, after describing the evil doings of those given over to a reprobate mind, Paul then explains that you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you that judges does the same things. He then goes on to say that to be justified by the law, you actually have to do it. And he already explained that you are guilty for doing all of those wicked works from chapter 1. 
And in verse 21 to 22, arguably he's tackling a Jewish mindset here based on verse 17. So he's basically saying that the Jews who judge the Gentiles for doing these evil sins are equally as guilty themselves. And so today you could just apply that to Christians who like to accuse the unbelievers. And then he tops this off by saying that by breaking the law, or sinning in other words, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And look at what they are fulfilling after Paul goes on to say it is written. He talks about circumcision. Now again, circumcision is not in of itself a sin issue. Just because you got circumcised doesn't mean that you sin less than people who have, haven't been. It's purely a covenantal matter. So in James and Jonah and Paul, we see that turning from sin or stop doing evil must be, or at least is documented as being accompanied with, doing good. They are two sides of the same coin. You can't isolate these from each other. So there it is. You can't just say that turning from sins is refraining from evil works in your life or that it's, that's your repentance in faith. You have to do good works in order to repent of your sins. It must involve doing works. And finally, that passage in 1 John chapter 3 that makes all these repent of your sins legalists draw with excitement literally defines sin as transgressing the law. So if you're trying to say, repent of your sins to be saved, you're trying to get salvation by the law. And you're not going to make it because you've already transgressed the law. It's too late for you. Not to mention the fact that all these hypocrites transgress the law after they've repented of their sins, apparently. But this is all works of the law. This is deeds of the law. This is doing the law for salvation if you have to repent of your sins. If you have to stop committing adultery and you have to stop doing this and you have to turn from this sin, well, then you also have to get circumcised. You can't just say that, oh, well, Paul was just talking about circumcision when he said without works. We still have to do good work. False. You do both or you do neither for salvation. It's that simple. Now, for the sake of time, we can't really dwell on this point, but lordshippers, particularly of the Calvinist variety, will say that we are not saved by repenting of our sins. We are saved by grace through faith, but repenting of sins is the result and evidence of salvation. Well, again, it's more of this double-talking politician speak, speaking out of both sides of their mouth, because if you really believed that, you wouldn't be going around saying, you must turn from your sins and trust in Christ, because that would be a backwards gospel. It would be, you believe on Christ, and then he will turn you from your sins. But that's not what they all go around saying, is it? And Ray Comfort, who is one of the flagship lordshippers of our generation, he says, first, you have to repent of your sins. Second, you have to believe. You don't believe first, then repent. You have to repent of sins first. That's what he says. So using it as a result when it's the first thing that you have to do doesn't make any sense. Because, of course, false doctrine never makes sense. And so logically speaking, if you have to first repent of your sins and second believe, well, then first you have to stop doing evil and you have to do good works even before you've even been regenerated. And then you can believe and be regenerated, even though it's supposed to be the result of those who have been generated. It's completely backwards. It makes absolutely no sense. It's complete nonsense, of course. But this is the kind of thing that comes out of the mouth of a complete fool like Ray Discomfort and all these other lordshippers and Calvinist ilk. So in conclusion, we see that, yes, repenting of your sins is works salvation. If you insist on proclaiming this, then repent of your own sins, stop being a liar and start being honest and admit that you trust in your works and stop pretending to believe in grace because grace and works cannot be mixed for righteousness. It is either by one or it is the other. It's that simple. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.